Order, order. Alistair's return to move the motion. Thank you, Mr. Pritchard, and I couldn't be happier or more privileged to be able to move this motion today. There are so many campaigns I'm lucky enough to get to work with as an MP, but since well before I was elected, one group has been a constant source of inspiration for me. And from the looks of a number of colleagues right around the hall today, I'm far from alone in being touched by the story of kinship carers yeah. right across the country. Yeah. From the very start of my by-election campaign, which colleagues may remember was rather a longer one than expected, kinship carers were meeting with me to set out their concerns locally, and none more so than Carol and Amanda. They sat me down and talked to me about the battles they'd faced, but how through their love and commitment to the young person in their care, they'd been able to fight through and make sure they could do everything they could to give their young charges the best possible start in life. You couldn't help but be inspired by these stories and their determination and the need to do right by them to ensure they have everything they need to take care of the young people they're looking after. Their love, that commitment, was matched only by their tenacity, which I found out four days after being sworn as an MP, where at my first constituency surgery, first through the door, yet again, Carol and Amanda, asking me what I'd done so far for kinship carers <laughs> and how I'd, be holding, you know, how I'd be championing this cause going forwards. But the truth is, Mr Pritchard, I could not be happier to be held to account on this important issue because it matters so, so much. And while I'm afraid, Carol, Amanda, I haven't quite been able to get you your meeting with the Prime Minister yet, that won't be for lack of trying, yeah. I hope today marks the start of a continuing commitment from me to you to champion the issue of kinship care in Parliament and to make sure we can make progress from some really important areas you've highlighted to me. In the run-up to this debate, Mr Pritchard, I've been truly moved by the number of kinship carers who've taken the time to write in to me, and I know colleagues right across this room have been too. Indeed, kinship told me today nearly 300 kinship carers right across the country in the last week alone have written to us to share their own personal, difficult but important testimony. The fact they've done so underlines why we're all here today. Because at its heart, kinship care is all about supporting a young person a young person that may have been through a really traumatic, difficult moment in life. Far more traumatic, far more difficult than many of us would hope ever to have to go through ourselves. And making sure that they, that young person, and people in their wider family unit have everything they need to care for them should be a matter of great importance to all of us. They step up to take on caring responsibilities at that really important time, at a time of real trauma and need. It could be a situation like Karen, who emailed me to tell me about the moment she had to take care of her grandson when he arrived at the start of lockdown with only the clothes on his back after his father had cut off all communication. Or Angela, who wrote in to tell me about the challenges she'd faced in her carrying out her caring responsibilities for her grandson while their parents had been battling through addiction. These stories are all unique and important, but they also trail one fundamental truth. At a time of need, kinship carers right across the country step up to provide love and care for a young family member at a really difficult time. Taking on these responsibilities, often at incredibly short notice, that they haven't planned or saved for. I fear, in the time available today, to make sure as many colleagues as possible can speak, I won't possibly be able to do justice to the wide range of emails and stories I've received. But I hope to be able to underline the passion, the urgency of their love and care, and highlight some of the clear areas we can all work together to go further faster for kinship carers in this country. As a former councillor with responsibility for children's social care, I got to see firsthand the moving and important work done by kinship carers to take on caring responsibilities and to make sure their young person could stay with a sense of place, with a sense of family and with familiar faces through those difficult moments. It was clear to me then, as it's clear to me now, that where possible, kinship care provides an amazing powerful way of ensuring that those traumatic moments in some young people's lives have as little impact as possible on their development and that that young person's true interests, their need to stay with the family, their need to stay with a place of sense of identity and place can be, can be protected and supported. It's no wonder thinking about this that the Independent Review of social, Children's Social Care found that where young people right across the country have been able to be placed with kinship carers, the outcomes are often far better. And these outcomes, Mr Pritchard, alone shouldn't be, should be more than enough to justify the support kinship carers need and are asking for. But if that wasn't enough to spur action, we should be clear. Failing to support and maintain every possible viable kinship care relationship 
means propping up a broken care system, an expensive care system that is all too often currently letting children down. Absolutely. Excellent uh, speech. Uh, now, the North East, where my constituency is, has the highest proportion of kinship care households in England. And many of my constituents have been in touch with me about the difficulties they face. Now, many children yet raised in kinship care have experienced loss and trauma. Does, does the member agree with me that we need to do more to support these children and provide spaces for them to socialise with peers? Absolutely. I thank the Honourable Member, my Honourable Friend, for her intervention. I think it highlights a really, really important point and one I'd be keen to hear from the Minister on in his response later about how we can all work together to make sure that support is put in place and those opportunities are provided for young people right across the country. In looking through these outcomes, the Independent Review of Children's Social Care rightly found, though, that despite the amazing work and commitment of kinship carers, we need to do far more as a country and we need our government to do far more to ensure that wherever kinship carers are taking on those responsibilities, wherever a possible kinship placement exists, everything is being done to support, nourish and champion it. There are a number of aspects that the Children's Social Care Review set out where we could be going further. And it was welcome to see in the government's own strategy announced in December last year, some of these being taken forward. And I thank the Minister for that and I look forward, hopefully, to hearing more about those in further areas today. But sadly, speaking to kinship carers and advocacy groups, as welcome as some of these measures were, it feels like it fell far short of the comprehensive support and recognition they need to ensure that many significant recommendations from the EU can finally be enacted in full. I'm sure there'll be lots of aspects colleagues around the room will want to focus on, so I'm going to try and touch on just three. First, the need for a clear and consistent local authority offer. One thing that came through loud and clear in the testimony to me is the current postcode lottery kinship carers right across the country face in terms of the support and offer to them from their local authority. I know Amanda, in my own constituency, faces a real battle of potentially having to move between a cliff edge in support when she moves between local authorities and quite rightly have concerns about what that might mean for her and her granddaughter. Shockingly, research has also found that over a third of local authorities don't even have a local family and friends care policy in place something legislation already requires. So I'd be keen to hear more from the Minister today about how existing requirements are being enforced, but also how they'll work and commit to act to make sure we've got strong requirements in local authorities, including considering whether an active, outward-facing local offer on par with care leavers might be helpful in compelling some of the support we'd like to see on this issue right across the country. Secondly, the need for fairness when it comes to care and parental leave. Kinship carers take on just the same responsibilities as other carer and parents, often, in fact, at much shorter notice, but don't currently benefit from the same entitlements to parental care leave as others. As Claire, a passionate kinship carer, powerfully raised at our recent APPG meeting, this can't be right and has a real impact on kinship carers and the child they support at a crucial moment. I'd be keen to hear more from the Minister on why a right to statutory pay on leave on par with adoption pay on leave wasn't committed to in the National Kinship Care Strategy and what barriers might exist for the Department of Business and Trade to work with the Department of Education to make sure this can finally be introduced. Finally, and I know to many kinship carers in the room today, perhaps most importantly, that issue of financial support. When it comes to financial support, the commitment to pilots is a welcome step forward. But for many kinship carers at the same time, this feels like yet another delay, which may mean support is never in place to reach them and their young person. Absolutely. Chairman of the Safeguarding Board, Mr Pritchard, and can I congratulate the Honourable Gentleman on securing this debate on a really important subject of a really undervalued cohort of uh, people in society today. I want to add a fourth to his uh, points, and all the points about practical support are absolutely valid, but what kinship carers also need is legal clarification as to their yeah. um, status and how it fits in with special guardianship orders, with family um, fostering and, uh, and so on. In the absence of primary legislation, does he agree that it needs to be made really clear what the options are to kinship carers who want to step up and do that really important job to have the full backing of the law and the status as in place of the parents to do that? Ab oh. Thank you, Mr Richard. I couldn't agree more with the Honourable Member. And I hope today maybe the Minister might be able to shed some light about whether the Government will be able to bring forward with a measure of haste and necessary urgency some of that primary legislation needed to give that formal legal definition, to give that clarification, to give certainty to kinship carers right across the country who can often find themselves in a very uncertain place 
in the bureaucratic and legalistic care framework as it currently exists. But on financial support, Stuart, a kinship care of two children, I think highlighted really powerfully, over and over again, whatever report you look at, whatever study you look at, the economic case for kinship care is overwhelming. It's clear and it's the right thing to do for the young people involved. So I welcome the Minister's thoughts on if we are going to have pilots, given the wealth of evidence already available, how these pilots can be delivered in a manner which ensures a national roll-up can follow them as quickly as possible. If they're looking for partner councils to help support this, I'm sure some of our Bedfordshire ones would be keen to, <laughs> to bite his hand off. But also to consider too, when thinking about these pilots, if in limiting the scope to children who have already been in the care system, the pilots risk reinforcing some of the very factors that currently push children into the very system its strategy is seeking to avoid excessive use of. These measures are not just important ones, Mr Pritchard, they're urgent ones. As is repeatedly raised with me, the young people in the care of kinship carers and who are here today deserve help and support, not years down the line, but now, when it can still make a difference for them, their family, and crucially, the young person they're trying to do everything they can to support. Because every day a kinship carer lacks a minimum standard of support from their local authority is a day their young person may not be receiving every bit of support they need to get the best start in life. Every month a kinship carer takes on responsibilities without care and parental leave is a month where some of those precious early moments in a young person's life may be forever missed. And every time a potential kinship carer is unable to take on caring responsibilities due to financial barriers, in a moment in which a better outcome for that young person, a young person who suffered real trauma, may forever be lost. Mr Chairman, every day we don't provide this support and more to our fantastic kinship carers is a day we're letting young people down right across the country. And so, Mr Pritchard, I pledge to carry not just the importance of these issues, not just the wealth of factual evidence that's been presented to me, but the clear urgency of these kinship carers' love, their commitment and their call for action with me today and throughout every day I'm lucky enough to serve as an MP. I know many colleagues around this hall today sharing that urgency, sharing their own stories and commitments to it, and I hope today the Minister will be able to share more on how the Government can show that urgency too. There's one we may not know when the general election will be, and I'm sure colleagues around the table would welcome any clarification on that point for the Minister too. Oh, we yeah. do know that kinship carers deserve this help, and they deserve this help now. They shouldn't have to go a day longer without the support. It shouldn't have to come to a general election. This shouldn't, and it clearly doesn't, feel around this table like a party political issue. So I look forward to hearing more from people around this table and from the Minister about how we can work together every day remaining in this Parliament to deliver for kinship carers right across the country. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered the kinship care strategy. Uh, can I, uh, before I call uh, Ben Everett, just say to colleagues, because this... Uh, uh, debate is oversubscribed. There will be a time limit of three minutes, uh, which might be shortened uh, later on in the debate. So, uh, Ben Everett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pritchard. I'm not sure what I've done to deserve to be called first. I may have been promoted accidentally. Um, but, uh, but thank you. It's appreciated anyway. It's a pleasure to serve under your uh, chairmanship. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, my neighbour, the Honourable Member for uh, Mid Bedfordshire, for securing this debate um, on the Government's new strategy for kinship care. He beat me to it. Um, because I've been trying to get one of these, um, but uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to give a three-minute speech as opposed to a 15-minute speech, so thank you. <laughs> um, grateful for the opportunity, not least, to speak on behalf of the brilliant kinship carers in Milton Keynes North. This strategy represents a huge step forward uh, for ensuring our incredible kinship carers across the country receive the financial support that they need and deserve, but also in terms of education through the expansion of virtual school heads and better advice for local authorities and schools. Chair, I welcome the government strategy um, that it will deliver a package of training and support for all kinship carers across England and that, that they can access that from this spring onwards. We are making progress. We're heading in the right direction, uh, engaging with kinship carers. I can see this. Um, however, there's always room for improvement and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm feeling the, uh, the heat that, uh, that my constituency neighbour has, uh, has described in his, because my kinship carers are incredibly vocal about coming forward about things that we can make, fine-tuning, tweaks, uh, things that we can do better. So it was clarified to me that training and information will be accessible via a supplier website, but there are still gaps to be addressed, specifically 
Um, will there be information about where to find and how to obtain support about the virtual school heads? And if so, in what form will that be made available? And my constituents have also made clear to me that this information needs to be integrated at the council level as well, so that those with special guardianship orders will be a better able to access the support. When we're talking about a better quality of life for children, the incredible sacrifices that kinship carers make every day, nobody should fall through the net. So continuing on that theme of education, Mr Chair, I'm aware that there's been no eligibility extension for the Pupil Premium Plus children under SGOs or child, child, children arrangement orders, which schools receive to support children in care. Without those resources, extra help within schools might not reach a consistent level across the board, and the strategy may not fulfil its full stated aims. Ultimately, it's in our interest to make the strategy work in the most effective way possible for our kinship carers, our schools, and our local authorities. The upshot here is that we need deeper integration between these three elements in order to deliver the best possible outcomes for children and their, fam and their families. And I look forward to hearing the Minister's response. Thank you, Mr Pritchard, and thank you, kinship carers, for the amazing work, sacrifice and love that you give. And before I call uh, Kevin Jones, uh, just say there is a clock and that will help colleagues try and uh, stick to the three minutes. Grateful. Kevin Jones. Mr Pritchard, can I congratulate the Honourable Member for Mid Bedfordshire for securing this debate? I first became involved in kinship care 15 years ago, a very tragic case in my constituency of a young woman who was kicked to death in front of her children and the two children were then uh, left with no parent because the uh, perpetrator was actually in jail. The grandparents stepped in, and that was my journey on the, uh, my first experience of kinship care. Since then, I've worked with them across County Durham and with the county council. Uh, they take on responsibility not because they look for financial gain, they, they do it through love. Uh, but then the state actually takes that for granted. Uh, and what we need to do, and I accept that the national strategy is it, it's the wrong approach in my opinion. We need a clear approach in terms of uh, what we just said about the legal status, because often these people are left with, when they first find themselves, with knowing what to do and what's the right approach. We need the integrate into the benefit system so that uh, these, these benefits are paid automatically, uh, and we need to coordinate at local level. Can I congratulate Durham County Council, who have got a great kinship carer unit, who I've worked with now for quite a few years, who work not just in terms of practical support, but also financial support. But again, it's time limited, that support. And I know I had one kinship carer who turned up at County on and left her kids there one day because the two-year rule was up for the support. These people, uh, I would actually say to, to government is, look, this is an investment in the future. Because if you get it right with these kids, uh, they're less likely to uh, get involved in the criminal justice system, they're less likely to be disruptive at school. They're less likely to, uh, you know, go off the road because they've, like, they've got that bubble of care around them, which is uh, usually a grandparent or a sibling. Uh, and if we have to then just look at it in those monetary terms, investment early on will pay itself back. Uh, it will also allow grandparents to continue working. Some of them have to give up work uh, to look after individuals. You also have situations where they don't expect to be in this position at their age. So although it is on the national radar screen, and let's have a local approach, let's create it in the benefit system, let's give support to these people and recognise that long-term investment that this is, you're not going to get the results straight away, but you are in, in period of time, you're going to have better citizens and you're going to have actually more productive uh, citizens in terms of the, wealth, uh, well, the kinship care themselves who are allowed to work, who are not under the pressure. We need a national system, for example, for uh, respite care. I have one kinship carer who's dealing with you know, three boys under 12, one with fecal alcohol syndrome, and she's 67. Now, these people are complete heroes for us. We need to invest them and we need to put money behind them and congratulate the work they do on all our behalfs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bobby Walker. 
Um, Mr. Pritchard, and congratulate the Honourable Gentleman for the Beverly for securing this very important debate. I think the turnout that we have in the Chamber reflects the importance which MPs across the House um, place on this issue. I, I have some brilliant local kinship carers, and I want to pay tribute to the work that Enza Smith has done over many years on behalf of kinship carers in Worcester, but also a constituent who came to see me recently, Julie Rose, uh, raising some of the issues, some of, uh, raising some of the concerns of the Value Our Love campaign. I don't want to repeat points that other Honourable Gentlemen have made, because I think they've made them very well, um, but I think the point of respite care is vitally important and I have to say in my constituency at the moment I am concerned by cuts to respite care. I hope that the additional 500 million which has been announced for children's and adult social care in the budget may help uh, local authorities to redress some of those um, but, but that is undoubtedly care. I also think kinship carers need access to other forms of support, bereavement support in many cases. Even where a, a parent hasn't actually died, children are facing separation uh, I I issues having moved uh, uh, away from their uh, 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 original parents and into the care uh, of another member of their family. Um, support um, such as counselling um, should be that is offered and support that is offered to foster families in many cases uh, needs to also be considered specifically for kinship carers. Of course I welcome the fact that we have the first kinship care strategy and I very much welcome uh, the pilots. I have asked for Worcestershire to be considered as one of those areas um, in, in which those pilots should be taking um, place but uh, I do think given the scale of what we know kinship carers are doing for children, um, we should be going beyond pilots here and we should be looking to fund and support kinship care more systematically um, across the country. I think the returns from doing so are pretty obvious and pretty clear. The outcomes, we've already heard, we've begun an inquiry into children's social care on the Education Select Committee. I don't want to preempt the outcome uh, of that inquiry because we're in the early days of receiving, but we've already heard about the much better outcomes uh, for children in kinship care, both in terms of life chances, long-term <coughs> employment, uh, and indeed life expectancy. Uh, we should be... We, we we should be celebrating all of those and the contributions uh, that families can make. I, I know my honourable friend for Chelmsford um, wishes she could be here and she has been making the point already on the select committee uh, about the need for um, parental leave effectively for kinship carers and, and for more systematic approach when people take on the responsibilities of kinship care uh, to them being able to, uh, to have some time to spend with their, their new charges uh, and we should be making sure that businesses are, are, are supporting that across the way. The guidance that is talked about in the kinship care strategy is a welcome first step in that. We will continue to work on this um, as part of our uh, work uh, on social care on the select committee uh, and I really look forward to hearing the evidence that kinship carers can bring to us so that we can strengthen the evidence based case for government to take further action. Andrew Quinn. Uh, thank you very much it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I also want to congratulate my honourable friend, the member for Mid Bedfordshire, for the eloquent way that he set out uh, the beginning of this debate, and I thank him for his support on this important issue. I'm the chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Kinship Care. I am because uh, I myself am a kinship carer. Uh, myself and my wife, Alison have the utter privilege of being the special guardians to our wonderful five-year-old grandson, Lyle. Uh, like many who find themselves as kinship carers, it was unexpected, it was unplanned. Uh, the social services stalk basically left a baby on our doorstep. And of course, around all the arguments that you could have about the structures and about the legalities, the one thing that comes to the fore at a moment like that is love. Every kinship carer does it for love uh, and only for love. Uh, I have to say special guardianship orders are far from a perfect device. Um, you are often left to defend yourself in a, a legal maze. If you're taken back to court for any reason... Um, you are literally on your own. Uh, I would much sooner, had I known what I know now, have remained a temporary foster carer of my grandson because at least you then share legal responsibility, parental responsibility, with the local authority. So if you're taken back to court on a spurious uh, argument you've got the backing of the local authority rather than yourselves. And these are the predicaments that far too many people find themselves in. I would like to see special guardianship orders strengthened, but also I want to get rid 
of the postcode lottery that sadly we now see when it comes to kinship services across uh, the land. Some local authorities have superb support for kinship uh, carers, some do not. And it cannot be right that where you live determines what support you can access. In theory, my wife and I can access support from the uh, post-adoption fund. In practice, that is incredibly difficult because the social services computer says no. The last thing I want to mention, Mr Pritchard, is parental leave because I do think that is something that if the government acts, it can make a big difference. And it's not just for employers, it's for this place. Because when I effectively became a dad again five years ago, the House of Commons did not recognise kinship parental leave as being necessary. Andrew Salou. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pritchard. I actually want to congratulate my parliamentary neighbour on bringing forward this very important debate. And I agree with every word of, that has been said by, by other members um, so far. Um, I want to look briefly at New Zealand because I understand in New Zealand there are only 48 in every 10,000 children are in care. And of those, 57% are in kinship care, whereas in England, 71 children out of every 10,000 children are in care, and only 15% are in kinship care. So I would say to my good friend, the minister, who I know cares deeply about this issue, um, could we have a look at New Zealand, and if there are lessons that we can learn from them, particularly in their use of family group conferences and the legal weight that those family group conferences have in New Zealand, I think that would be helpful. I think it's a wonderful country. I think we do lots of things well, but we, we, we should always be humble enough to learn from other countries who may have um, something to teach us. Um, my constituents, who I have spoken to uh, on this issue, um, tell me that they want urgent and really accurate information. I spoke to one quite recently who didn't know if she was entitled to child tax credits or not. My reading of the House of Commons uh, briefing note is that she is. She didn't know that. She hadn't been told that. I've um, been in contact with another constituent recently, a grandmother had to come out of work to look after her grandson when her daughter very sadly died. She needs an urgent nursery place for her grandchild. Now again, I've spoken to the specialist in the House of Commons Library about this afternoon. My understanding, she is entitled to that free nursery place and the government helped towards it for her grandchild, but she hasn't been told that. I have sent her the library briefing note and I will do everything I can to help. But this highlights to me um, an urgent information gap. My constituents have also told me they are concerned about the cost and the uncertainty of getting a special guardianship order. And the honourable gentleman who's just uh, spoken, very eloquently if I may say so, has told us that it's not a panacea in any case. And I think that is a worry. And I have constituents, that be, the first thing they've been told by social services is you need a care order. Well, if you're worried it's expensive, it's lawyers, you've never been to court before, how's it all going to work out? You know, care is sort of needed um, now. And I think, you know, just to trying to move towards some form of financial parity with foster carers uh, would uh, clearly be uh, sensible. Just in the remaining 20 seconds, we've talked about grandparents looking after grandchildren. I just observed that in Germany, in adult social care, the most popular option of taking the money is for friends and family to look after elderly or frail loved ones. So we're looking mainly downwards at children, but actually looking at frail family members. This could work as well. Nero Wilson. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, Mr Pritchard, and can I congratulate the Honourable Member for Mid-Bedfordshire for securing this important debate. And I wanted to start also by paying tribute to the fantastic work of many campaigners on this issue, uh, several of whom are here today. Um, it is thanks to their hard work and their tireless commitment to the cause that we even have a kinship care strategy that was published just before Christmas. That, the publication of that strategy was a real milestone. It's finally put kinship on the map and that is an achievement to which, uh, for which I pay tribute to the campaigners. However, this strategy was a real missed opportunity and it fell very far short of the ambition the Minister himself set out in his response to my debate in this chamber back in September and indeed much of the, the, the text of the strategy uh, was 
set out the challenges, but I'm afraid many of the solutions fell far short of addressing them. Uh, firstly, on allowances. The Minister said back in September that kinship carers need more support than is currently available to them. He pointed out that there's no great logic that foster carers' allowances are not on a par with kinship carers, and he recognised the strain that kinship families were under. Yet only eight local authorities are going to be part of the pilot, and even in those local authorities, it's going to be a tiny subset of kinship carers, and we've got this perverse situation that only a previously looked-after child will be able, uh, that, that family will be able to claim an allowance. Yet actually, it's local authorities that are going to families to prevent children going into care in the first place to help them save money. And even the minister recognised in the debate in September that, um, that it's much more cost effective for local authorities to put children into kinship care than into uh, local authority care. The savings actually are very much realisable short term as well as long term. The Honourable Member for North Durham talked about long term savings, but actually about £35,000 per child can be saved by putting them in kinship care rather than in local authority care. So I beg the Minister, if he's going to stick to just eight local authority pilots, please at least look at expanding the eligibility criteria. Many Honourable Members have already talked about the lack of uh, movement on employment support and lack of commitment to statutory pay or leave. Uh, again, this is a huge disappointment. Kim, in my constituency, who first brought, me, uh, brought my attention to the issue of kinship care, had to reduce her hours significantly. So many people do, uh, and it's typically women, because it's often grandmothers who are already suffering from the gender pay gap who are losing out. This is a key barrier that needs to be removed. There are so many things I don't have time to say, but I just say to the Minister, he said in September he was determined to do as much as he could. He needs to go back to the Treasury and the Department for Business and ask for more, because this strategy is just scraps, and these carers deserve an awful lot more. Here, here. Thank you very much, Mr. Richard. And it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I would also like to extend my congratulations to my honourable friend, the member for mid Bedfordshire, for um, uh, securing this important debate and for leading it with such energy and uh, an excellent introduction, uh, and also for championing the, the cause of kinship carers. Kinship carers play an immeasurable role in our communities. They set up and care for children when, parents, when, the, when the children's parents no longer can. The complexities associated with full-time care for someone else's child, even if it's a family member, shouldn't be underestimated. The love, care and stability these families offer kinship children is nothing short of remarkable. Yeah, yeah. Their actions enable countless young people to remain within their own families and existing support networks. It's for these reasons we must enhance support for kinship carers. To its credit, in December of last year, the government published the first ever national kinship strategy. It was a welcome recognition of and support for kinship families. However, it falls far short of the support that these families urgently need. Currently, there are more than double the number of children in kinship than in foster care. Considering this, the government really must support kinship carers in the same way that we do support foster carers. In my own region in the North East, around 1 in 50 children are growing up in kinship care, with over half being looked after by grandparents. Kinship uh, Charity runs a number of successful support groups across my constituency, as my honourable friend said, County Durham are a kind of a, 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 an outstanding local authority for the support that they offer. They help families support one another through very challenging times. However, there's only so much that the Kinship char Charity can do. And I support their cause for the introduction of a mandatory non-means-tested allowance for all kinship carers which is at least equivalent to the national minimum fostering allowance, which was also recommended by the Independent Review of Social Care. Please be aware, eight in 10 kinship carers are forced out of work or mu must reduce hours due to lack of financial support. I want to mention my, my old friend uh, and constituent Elaine Duffy. She's a kinship carer. She has three grandchildren, had to give up her full-time work because she couldn't sustain the commitment to a caring role while working full time. Her dedication is commendable, and fortunately, she's now employed by the Bryn Bryn 
Brilliant Kinship Charity, and she works very hard to support their campaigns alongside looking after her three grandchildren. The government must consider successful models in New Zealand and in Scotland, and I urge the government to do far more and support our kinship carers. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairship, Mr Pritchard. And I congratulate the Right Honourable Member for Mid-Bedfordshire for championing this issue so strongly and for laying out the issues so clearly. I'd also like to thank the charities Kinship and the Family Rights Group and Bernardo's for all their work on kinship care. And a big thanks to all those kinship carers in my constituency in Putney who are offering all of their support and love to so many young people and to those constituents who've been to my surgery and explained that in times of need, there was a, one lady who came to me most recently in time of great need for her, she was able to, uh, that, that her mother took on her daughter for a time and then she was able to move back in with her several years later. But the problem was that in those years that she looked after her daughter, she suffered enormous financial hardship. And that's what she wanted to raise with me, and that's what I'd like to talk to you today. Because I believe that kinship carers fall between having the responsibility of parents without the rights mm -hmm. and the responsibility of foster carers without the training, support and pay. And so that's inevitably going to have an impact on the young person they are caring for. A recent survey found that 12% of kinship carers were concerned they may have to stop caring for their kinship child in the next year if their situation doesn't improve. This is the last thing they want to do. They are full of love, but they are also impacted financially by suddenly having to take on those commitments. So financial support is the main ask, also for legal costs. The second ask is for statutory paid leave. It's very unfortunate that that's missed out of the kinship strategy. Um, chair, I would like to see that looked at as a matter of urgency. The third has been raised by other members today. It's that postcode lottery di between different um, author local authorities actually looking around and exploring whether kinship care is appropriate when a child is about to go into care. I was really surprised to find this out, that not e every avenue is explored before a child goes into care to look at family members, but actually there's a lack of consensus and understanding by different authorities. A fourth area is this lack of de legal definition that's been raised by many. As a result, kinship carers are often not being recognised in their parenting role by services, by schools or employers. And the Value Our Love campaign is to be commended. And I would like to raise their issues to equalise allowances between foster and kinship fam families, to equalise access to training and support between kinship carers and foster carers, to equalise leave between adoptive and kinship families, and to equalise support between children in kinship care and those in care. I'd like to ask the Minister today, who I know cares about this issue, to look at the gaps in the kinship care strategy. Action today will keep families together, will save money, will radically change the life opportunities for hundreds of thousands of children and young people in Putney and across the country. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Ian Byrne. Under your chairship, uh, and thank you to the honourable member from Bedfordshire uh, for leading this important debate. It's vitally important that the issue of support for kinship carers, including the many incredible kinship carers in my constituency of Liverpool West Derby, is being discussed in this house today. Many families say they feel invisible, undervalued, unimportant, and ignored by the government. And 75% of kinship carers entered the cost of living crisis in severe financial hardship. We know that children growing up in kinship care are better emotional, behavioural and educational outcomes than children in unrelated foster care. And I've seen that with my own eyes with the fantastic group in Liverpool. Yet kinship carers does not get the recognition anywhere near the recognition it fully deserves. Support provided to kinship carers, including financial, legal, practical and emotional support, is nowhere near what the families need. But there's been some very important work happening in Liverpool with the Kinship Charter, developed by... Pauline Thornley from Kinship Liverpool and their magnificent team and by our local kinship families. The Charter is the first of its kind in the country, a groundbreaking achievement for kinship carers and their loved ones, something we in Liverpool are extremely proud of, rightly proud of, and I'd like to place my, on record my thanks to Liverpool City Council for their efforts on the Charter and Pauline and the team. However, families also urgently need more support at national government level. Thanks to the fierce campaign in the kinship carers and charities, the government's thankfully recently published the first ever national kinship care strategy. However, I and many of my constituents and Kinship Liverpool share the thoughts of the charity kinship that the government's strategy provides welcome recognition of and new support for kinship families, 
but the overall investments and commitments made do not deliver the urgent help with kinship families need today, nor build a kinship care system fit for the future. So the Minister should act on the concerns of families and campaigners. So today I ask the Minister to commit to legislating and it's funding a full rollout in all local authorities of financial support to kinship families that is equal to that of foster and adoptive families. Commit to a new statutory pay and leave offer for kinship carers that is on a par with adoption pay and leave. And lastly, equalise access to training support between kinship carers and foster carers, as has been called for by so many members today. Minister, these changes would make a huge difference to kinship families in Liverpool, West Derby, and indeed beyond. And many of the fantastic campaigners here will attribute to that. And if the current government will not act to implement these changes, I very much hope that a potentially incoming Labour government will act on these changes, uh, act uh, and action these changes. It's the at very, very least these fantastic, amazing people do. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Call Jim Chan and just remind the uh, front bench five minutes for the opposition, ten minutes. Motion, if the minister is so minded, and there is time, a minute or two uh, to wind up. Jim Shannon. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and uh, uh, pleasure to serve only your chairship for the third time this afternoon. So, uh, a real pleasure. Can I commend the, the honourable gentleman for uh, Mid Bedfordshire for bringing this forward? And I want to give an ordinary perspective to the whole thing, as I always do. It's about what we do back home, and, and, and obviously the minister. Uh, would have some input into that, and I would seek his, uh, his assistance to, to see how we can make it better. In Northern Ireland, some 3,801 children and young people were recorded in care in, in March 23, 177 more than 2022. It's the highest recorded number there's ever been in Northern Ireland since 1995, some 29 years ago. It tells you a wee bit about the issue. Everybody's illustrated that very clearly. Some 22% of the children have been in care for less than a year, 32%. Um, almost um, 1,300 of them have been in care for five years or longer. So there's a real issue for us in, in relation to uh, back home for foster care. But the issue of the debate today is about the kings, kingship care strategy. This increase is certainly concerning and highlights, I believe, the issue of kin, kinship care even more when we fully consider uh, over half of those in foster care are in kinship um, foster care as well. Two questions for the Minister, if I can, along with the, the Northern Ireland perspective to it. Um, I understand that the... Um, Foster carers were given a foster care allowance of some 12%. Uh, it seemed that that didn't go as far as the, as the kinship foster carers it should have. Uh, maybe the Minister can clarify and give us some indication if, if that is the case. Uh, secondly, some £9 million will be invested in bespoke uh, uh, training uh, and support offered for all kinship carers. Again, excellent news, but I'm a great believer that the, the real devil is in the detail. Uh, so I'd like to know a wee bit more about how that will work as well. For, for many families who take in their siblings' uh, uh, child, they do so not for the money, as Honourable Gentleman referred to it, other people have referred to it as well, they do it for the love of, of the children. That's what it's all about. It's all about the motivation isn't the money, but the money helps them do some of the things that, that they would like to do. Love doesn't buy the school uniforms. Love doesn't buy the clothes. So they need that extra, that extra support. Uh, so I, I believe, Minister, there's a real need uh, for extra uh, urgent recruitment of foster parents and kinship uh, parents in Northern Ireland. Again, could I ask the Minister? I always do it gently. I do it humbly because I ask the Minister with all graciousness, uh, knowing that he will do that uh, with the relevant Minister in Northern Ireland to make sure that we can take it forward and help. Um, one of my local businessmen took his children to Florida, he has children of his own, and he, and he fostered. The point I make with this here, he loves all of those kids and he treats them all as their own. They don't do this for money. They never do. Money would never pay the bills uh, for, for their holidays or anything. But the fact is that many others uh, could not do it without the sub financial support. And we must get this right, not simply in the strategy for England here in the mainland, but across all of this great United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And it begins with kinship care being recognised and supported appropriately. Thank you very much. Alan Hayes, Shadow Minister. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see you in the chair today. Um, I congratulate my honourable friend, the member for Mid Bedfordshire, on securing today's debate on such an important subject and on speaking so powerfully on behalf of kinship carers in Mid Bedfordshire. I know we are joined by kinship carers in the chamber today and I want to start by paying tribute to them for the love and support they give to the children in their care. It is always humbling to meet kinship carers and to hear about their experiences. It is an extraordinary thing to step up to care for a child when a family member or a friend is unable to do so. Yet for every kinship carer I meet, it is never a choice but an instinct 
for a child who they love. I also want to pay tribute to Kinship, the Family Rights Group, the Kinship Care Alliance and the APPG on Kinship Care for all of their vital work, supporting and giving voice to the experiences and needs of kinship families. We have heard from many honourable members this, this afternoon, uh, which is a testament in itself to the importance of this issue all across the country. I don't have the time to mention every uh, contribution individually, but I do want to mention the contributions from um, the Honourable Member for Worcester, the Chair of the Select Committee, who, having looked at the evidence, highlights the support the need to support kinship carers much more systematically across the country. Um, my honourable friend, the member for Denton and Reddish, um, who spoke uh, once again uh, about his experience as a kinship carer um, for his grandson, Lyle. And I have to say, I look forward to these debates for the opportunity to have an update on <laughs> Lyle's progress. Um, he's a wonderful little boy. Um, the honourable, um, my honourable friend, the member for Easington, spoke about the difficulties facing kinship carers who give up employment um, to care for the, the, the children that they look after. My honourable friend, the member for North Durham, um, talks about how the state takes for granted uh, the love that kinship carers give, and he is right about that. Um, and my honourable friend, the member for Putney, spoke about how kinship carers are parents without rights and foster carers without um, the support or training that foster carers get, how they fall between those two categories. Um, uh, and finally, my honourable friend, the member for Liverpool West Derby, paid tribute to the work of his local authority in supporting kinship carers. There are an estimated um, 141,000 children across England and Wales growing up in kinship care. Most will have experienced a traumatic event such as a bereavement, abuse or neglect. Kinship carers themselves will often have shared in the trauma which led to a grandchild, niece, nephew or close friend coming into their care. These are hugely challenging circumstances for every family which make kinship care much more than simply welcoming a family member into your home. But often kinship carers are left without the wraparound support they need. There is a clear consensus from the debate today on the need for greater support for kinship carers. We welcome the publication of the government's long overdue kinship care strategy. For far too long kinship care has been undervalued and underrecognised and it's testament to the hard work of campaigners that the strategy has finally been published. The strategy is a step in the right direction but sadly it falls short of what kinship carers were hoping for. Many of the measures announced will only be implemented through pilots meaning most kinship families will not see the benefits for several more years. In the very limited time this afternoon, I want to press the Minister on um, legislating for a legal definition of kinship care. The guidance is welcome, um, but that statutory footing is what campaigners are asking for. Um, the uh, pilot around the, the, the equivalent of the foster care allowance for kinship carers. Just eight local authority areas, just a very, very, very limited number of kinship carers. Kinship carers are facing hardship now, and we need more action from the government on this. Um, the um, strategy rightly discussed the need for greater advice for kinship carers and the need for stronger guidance for local authorities. Um, there is a huge postcode lottery in the support kinship carers receive. Statutory guidance has been in place for more than 12 years, but we know that many local authorities are not implementing it. So I want to ask that the Minister today what he is doing to ensure that all local authorities are implementing the guidance and whether he will consider laying regulations um, if the current situation persists. Um, guidance for employers is welcome, but again, what is the Minister doing to ensure that the guidance is implemented and just a word finally on how it is impossible to separate the, the challenges that are faced by kinship carers from the wider pressures on our social care system and on families in the current context. Labour in government has always put children and families first. We will do so again working with kinship carers and those who support them on the support and recognition they need. Minister. Thank you very much Mr Pritchard. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I can't possibly do justice to uh, this debate, uh, all the points raised, and certainly not to the fantastic role that all kinship carers play. And it's great to see some of them in the audience again. Um, today, I had the pleasure of meeting them briefly uh, before this debate, but I know we'll have a lot more opportunities to discuss in more detail. I congratulate the Honourable Member for Mid-Bedfordshire on securing this important debate. People have, who've been in these debates before have heard me talk about the fact my first experience of this was, was many years ago mentoring a nine-year-old boy who had to be removed from his parents 
and was put with his nan, and she totally transformed his life, as everybody has said, out of love, uh, certainly not out of money, and to prevent him going into care uh, and taking other um, bad directions in, in life. And that was my first experience, which is why I was so excited for us to publish the first strategy before the end of the year. I wholeheartedly share the Honourable Member's commitment to championing the role of, of kinship carers. I've spoken to many um, through the reference group and in visits all over the country and just have huge admiration for the role that they are doing, um, often unseen. And the conversation I always have with them is that there's a lot of attention, rightly, on people who adopt, a lot of attention, rightly, on people who foster. Uh, but kinship carers are something that most people, if you went down the street and said, what's a kinship carer, people wouldn't know what it is, and yet you're playing an incredible, incredible role. Um, we also know, though this is not the reason you do it, that, that children in kinship care will, will uh, on average, end up with better GCSE results, better employment outcomes, better long-term health outcomes. Um, so it makes sense for the country as a whole, in addition to making sense for, for you and the children that you are taking on. Um, starting with financial allowance, I, uh, we know from the many conversations we have with kinship carers that the decision to take on this role, uh, nobody is expecting to take on the role uh, when, they, when they do so. We have announced this pathfinder for eight local authorities that will provide special guardian uh, kinship carers. Um, with pre uh, very briefly, because I don't have much time to get to everybody's point. Very carefully, what, what, what the minister is saying. Uh, could, could you tell us uh, the, the eligibility criteria or, or the basis on which the eight pilot authorities have been chosen? Yeah. So we're, we're starting with 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 this. Um, so we haven't announced the local authorities. So let's do that that bit first, and then to the points that people have raised about why we're starting with this particular subset of of children in special guardianship orders. Um, they are one of the easiest groups to define, often have the highest need, and it's quickest for local authorities to be able to pay, to make the payments to this group, and we want to get it going as quickly as possible. But subject to its success, we want to be able to broaden it to the full range of, of people in kinship care and to the other local uh, authorities. But we haven't chosen the, the, the eight yet. Um, uh, on virtual school heads... Um, while some children in kinship arrangements have already been able to benefit from, from um, education entitlements and support, one of the constant conversations I've had with kinship carers is that they feel it, find it very difficult at times to get the school to engage with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and even though they are acting as the parent, they're not getting the same conversations and treatment that, 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 that a parent would get. So that's why we announced 3.8 million to expand the role of virtual school heads um, to children in kinship care. All children in kinship care arrangements will get this, regardless of their, their status. Um, my honourable friend from Milton Keynes North raised this point and making sure everybody's aware that, that they are there. The local authority grant letters are being published um, uh, imminently. Delivery will start in September, and we'll do all we can to make sure that everybody knows they exist. On kinship leave... Uh, raised by my honourable friend, the member for Worcester and others. We do recognise the, the challenge many kinship carers face in, in continuing to work alongside the pressures of taking in and raising a child at, a, at an unexpected uh, moment. Um, we're continuing to explore what we can, we can do here. We have published guidance, as some members have, have commented on, uh, for employers to better support kinship carers in work. Some employers are already doing this. The Department for Education is going to give... Uh, uh, kinship leave to its staff that are kinship carers. We expect other government departments to do similarly in the coming weeks and months. On um, uh, training and support, which was raised by the members for Putney and for Strangford and, and, and others, um, we announced a 1.6 million extension to our peer support funding, uh, which will be delivered from July. And that will mean that all kinship carers, regardless of their care order, will be able to... Um, network and learn from each other until the end of March 2026. And then following the progress and positive impact, the peer-to-peer the -peer support contract has already made. We've committed to delivering a package of training and support that all kinship carers across England can access. Um, and we were pleased to confirm that the charity 
Kinship uh, will be the, the training partner and the training is on track to be delivered from spring 2024. Um, on the definition, um, we know that many kinship carers feel a clear definition of kinship care will help to reduce barriers to them accessing services and support, creating a common understanding of what kinship care means. Um, we are proud to have published the first government definition of a kinship carer. Uh, this year we will implement this in statutory guidance to improve understanding and awareness from practitioners about what kinship care is. On a related matter raised by the member for Mid Bedfordshire, uh, we've asked the Law Commission to review and simplify uh, the, the framework for kinship care status. And on the point made by him and the member for Denton and Reddish about inconsistent support from local authorities, um, we're publishing family, an updated version of family and friends guidance um, this spring, and we will be monitoring compliance. I had a conversation with him at his APPG about the fact, for example, we found local authorities not paying the minimum uh, fostering allowance that we give them the money to be able to do so. So local authority compliance uh, is something very much in my sights. Uh, this year, we will recruit the first ever National Kinship Care Ambassador to advocate for kinship carers and work directly with local authorities to improve services um, that should go live for recruitment this, this month. I look forward to working with the appointed candidate, and they will also help us with ensuring that local authorities are providing a, a consistent service compliant with, with what we require them to do. Um, we're also creating a board of sector experts in addition to our kinship care reference group to advise me on priorities for both future funding and policy development. Now to quickly do uh, some other points uh, raised, the member, my honourable friend, the member for South West Bedfordshire asked about family group conferencing and, and New Zealand and we are exploring using legislation to mandate the use of, of family group uh, conferencing at pre-proceedings um, and my predecessor met with colleagues from New Zealand uh, in order to discuss how it works there. The members for North Durham and Liverpool West Derby both described what sounded like very good local offers to support uh, kinship carers in their, in their local areas and I'm going to ask officials to follow up with them to make sure we're aware of the good work that they're doing. Um, I need to leave a couple of minutes for the Honourable Member. So if there's any points I haven't addressed, then I'm happy to write to people very briefly. Address the issue of Pupil Premium Plus and priority admissions for children in kinship care, because we know looked after children get those benefits, but kinship children don't, and it wasn't in the strategy. Uh, I will write to the Honourable Lady ab ab about that, because it's a longer answer than the 30 seconds I have in order to allow him to... to, to Finished, but, but we are proud of the progress we're, we're already making to support kinship carers through the strategy, but we know there's more to do. And I'm fully committed to reducing the barriers to kinship care, um, where it's in the best interest of the child to offer safe, stable and a loving alternative to becoming looked after. I'm also determined that we keep the profile of kinship carers as high as possible and that people do understand the vital role they're playing for the children in their care and for the country as a whole. I'm grateful to the Minister. Alistair Trotheran to wind up. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Pritchard. It's been a real pleasure serving under your chairmanship this afternoon. I'd like to thank the wide range of contributions we've had today from my honourable friends, the Member for Bladen, North Durham, Denton Redditch, Easington, Putney and Liverpool West Derby, as well as the honourable members from East Worthing Shoreham, MK North, Worcester, South West Bedfordshire, Twinkenham and Strangford. It will be very difficult in these two minutes for me to do justice to the wide range of issues you've highlighted today, but I think the range of contributions and the sheer number of contributions today gives me two important takeaways. One, there are a significant number of areas we really do need to go further to do right for our kinship carers. But secondly, and more encouragingly, encouragingly the sheer range of cross-party consensus of this around the House that hopefully should mean we can move with the urgency this issue demands over the remaining days of this Parliament. I'm very grateful for the Shadow Minister for her contributions, I think showcasing and highlighting some of these really important areas where we do need to go further and really underlining our party's commitment to making sure these are tackled. And I thank the Minister for the work he's done on this issue and some of the things he's pushed along through the strategy. I do want to flag, though, that I think the fact that we haven't even got to the point where the pilots have been chosen yet yeah. may be a cause of some concern to carers who currently fear that we aren't yet in a position <laughs> uh, to, to even announce that. 
really it just underlines the sense that maybe things aren't moving with the urgency this issue demands. And similarly, I think when it comes to parental leave, the fact that we've had so many representations today for me really makes clear that guidance is unlikely to be enough. And actually, we are going to need to go further. I would urge him to reconsider that. But finally, and in my last remaining seconds, I'd like to thank the fantastic kinship carers and advocacy groups here today. Their love, their commitment, their dedication, day after day to look after their young people, breaking through so many of the issues and barriers we've said have often been put in their way, is truly inspiring. The fact, though, that you do all of that and then go beyond to advocate not just for yourselves, but for kinship carers and future and potential kinship carers right across the country, so that they and their young people don't have to face those challenges, is really inspiring. I hope today you've, you've seen that you have parliamentary allies on this cause right across the House. And I'm looking forward to working with everyone in this room to continue to champion your cause between now and the time when we can finally say the support you need, the support you deserve is in place. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Chair. Yeah. The question is that this House has considered the kinship care strategy. As many of that opinion say, aye. aye. The country, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order. The sitting stands adjourned. Have a good evening. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.